Hello, beautiful people. I am so happy that you are all here. I feel so blessed and so overjoyed. Um, my name is Eileen Strumpel, and I have the honor and really deep pleasure of serving as the inaugural dean here at the Herb Alpert School of Music. Um, and welcome. I'm this, here. We are. Yay! So I want to start by. Um, by welcoming members of our inaugural alumni board. You are truly a distinguished body of creatives, of executives out there changing the world. And we're just so grateful to have this time to start to come together, you know, for you all to get to know each other, to connect with each other, but then also really importantly, to connect to our students. They need to see role models. They need to see how it's done. How do you, you know, the, this kind of building a life in music and to be able to, to see all these diverse experiences, these different pathways, these different passions, it means everything. And I want to welcome the students that are here tonight. Um, I know you have a lot of questions for the alumni board, um, but everyone and anyone should ask questions because it's really a conversation that we're here to have tonight. Um, but boy, what a wonderful way to have some of our most amazing students that I love so much, um, to have you have a connection right here to some of our most distinguished and beloved alums. Um, a hearty alumni welcome. Here you all are, and to have you back in the school, for some of you, you come back all the time, for others, it may be the first time in a while. As Dean, I'm just so happy to have you here with us. I can't even tell you. And this is at such an auspicious moment for the school. Um, we're just kind of in this little soft launch, but um, I want to announce from the stage tonight, we've had the final approvals from the state, and this fall we are officially launching our music industry program. Yay. So get, get ready for some exciting things ahead. Um, you know, I, when you look at some of the data that says that 26% of the globe's music industry jobs are here in Los Angeles, 26%. Um, and so when we, we kind of were looking to, you know, what's going to make the school unique and how do we build from the beauty of Los Angeles? And um, boy, connecting in a really intentional way to some of, um, to the beautiful evidence of what a UCLA education can lead to, how, it get ma how it's manifest in different experiences. Inspire us all, you know, just like let us hear your story. Thank you for telling your story, for sharing with us because, um, Boy, the school is um, just on this upward trajectory. The music industry program will officially be launching this fall as our largest program. So talk about a huge um, shift. Uh, so just, I'm, it's so weird when you've been fantasizing about something for a while and then it actually <laughs> comes true and you realize you're not delusional, but you're actually like a dream comes to happen. And so thank you all for, you know, this has been such a team effort and to, to start to see it come together is really beautiful. So thank you for being dream makers um, and change makers. And now I'd love to introduce our alumni board chair our beloved Ryan Svensson. And so you never knew it, trumpet player, graduate. Yeah, like here we are, like ninth, in 2010, trumpet player grad. And now, you know, the head of Millennium Music. And you know, what an interesting career trajectory. Um, you know, United Talent Agency and the Azov Music Live Nation and then at Lionsgate Entertainment. Um, and you may just know him now as working not just on those film and movie soundtracks, but probably, you know, La La Land. And now we have Little Nas coming out, I hear. We've got some summer fun songs that might be the top of our playlist that have a, a certain trumpet player's hook. Um, <laughs> so just welcome you all here. Just so happy to just have this gathering. Um, you could be any place tonight, but you're here with us. Thank you and welcome. Yeah. And Thank you so much. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Dean Strample, so much for all your hard work and, and everything you do for the School of Music. Um, I wish I had you in my back pocket for that intro whenever I had a conference call or something. I would get promoted instantly. It would be absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, it's, it's a really exciting evening. Uh, this is called Insider Access, uh, and we have a fantastic group of panelists with us today. Um, just by a show of hands for any of the undergrads, have you ever been asked what your major is and you say music and then the response is, well, what are you gonna do with that? 
<laughs> I, would, I would get that asked that all the time. And if you're a performance major, you might want to respond, well, I hope to tour the world and provide music to countless amount of people and bring joy into people's lives. If you're going the music management route, you might want to say, I, I hope to curate an artist's career and handle their tour and budgeting so that they become the next Taylor Swift or uh, Post Malone, right? If you're a composition major, it might be, I want to be the soundtrack to your life and, and provide you with music for your favorite TV show, video game, or film. And I think that, especially in music, and why that we get asked that question is because it's not as clear cut as other career paths, like becoming a lawyer or a doctor. There's not certain certifications, like passing the bar or going to your residency, to guarantee a position in the music industry. And that's why we put this panel to, together today, because there's certain best practices that you can follow. And you're gonna hear some amazing stories of the best practices that everyone here has followed to get to where they are. And uh, we want it to be an open discussion as well, so we're gonna have a Q&A period after. We're gonna take about five to seven minutes with each panelist, kind of dive into their world, learn a little bit more about them. We're gonna have a lightning round in between so everyone stays engaged. So I'll start with that real quick. We'll go, we'll go right down the row here. Uh, first question is, best concert you have ever attended? I don't know best, but recent favorite was the Harry Styles concert, just because two of my best friends are in his band and it was a special moment. And Good. honestly, the songs are great. <laughs> Good answer. Oh gosh, best concert, that's really hard. Cause You're playing in a lot of I them, so I know it's them, tough. So, so I you love could... every single one that I do. <laughs> but I think, uh, I think um, I want to, if I can generalize a little bit, one of my favorite kind of performances are stadium shows. Those are like the most raucous, crazy things. If anyone ever gets a chance to try one of those out, definitely do one of those. Um, I don't know about favorite, but a memorable one was Esperanza Spalding. It was like a more intimate mm. setting. It was incredible. I would say mine would be Garth Brooks. I've seen him a few oh. times. He's in pure entertainer. So. Mm -hmm. Danny Elfman, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, I love that. That's a heavy hitter right there. He's the composer. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Wait, can, I change, uh, can I change my answer? We have an amendment. This is the yes. kind of thing that we Go can't on. change your answer, but I'm going to take this opportunity. My, one of my favorite ever concerts, uh, Mighty Wind at the Getty, the Getty Museum. If, if you know anything about any of that kind of stuff, uh, Mighty Wind, if you haven't checked them out, you should definitely hear of them. Fantastic. Uh, I'll just chime in as well. My favorite was Taylor Swift. I, I went a month ago. It's my first Taylor Swift. It, it was a crazy story. I had to do wild things, but we got the tickets. And uh, it was the wildest stage production I've ever seen. Um, I hope they make a Netflix movie about it. Maybe we could talk later, guys. And, uh, you know, uh, There we go. We're already networking. Here we go. I don't even represent Taylor Swift, so I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, let's start with Nicole. Cohen, uh, let me read your bio here. Singer-songwriter of K-pop writing projects for Red Velvet and BTS, 2023 Grammy nominated for her work with Kelly Clarkson. Absolutely fantastic. So, um, yeah, give a round of applause. 2023 Grammy nomination right here. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, just starting off, what would you consider as your first big break? Um, did it happen during your time at UCLA? And if so, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure, Ryan. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> My first introduction to the music industry did happen at UCLA. I was taking a class called Songwriters on Songwriting, which I don't know if it's around anymore. Hopefully it is. Oh, incredible. Um, Professor David Leaf. Uh, a songwriter came into the class named Rick Knowles, who has done a bunch of Lana Del Rey and a ton of other amazing work, and he needed somebody to sing Young and Beautiful. And I was like... I will do it. And I got up and sang with him. And afterwards, David pulled me aside and he said, oh, you showed a little bit of tenacity there. Send me some music if you have any. And I'd been writing songs for half my life at that point. So I sent him a link and he introduced me to a manager who I do not speak to anymore. But <laughs> the manager introduced me to Cobalt, a publishing company. And I ended up signing with Cobalt three years later after I graduated. And I'm still with them now. So in a way, it was a break. I don't think anybody in music really has a big break, though. It's all little building blocks and steps, and if it was ever enough, there would be no music industry. So that's the answer, I guess. <laughs> it was at UCLA, yeah. Amazing. Uh, so you, would you say persistence and that networking mindset started here at UCLA and 
ultimately paid off because of that connection and just continuing to pursue it and follow it. Definitely, yeah. When I was introduced to Cobalt, I wasn't aware of the way that the music industry works, which is people keep an eye on you for a while, and it's all relationship building, and you don't walk into... It happens every once in a blue moon where you're handed a, a record label, and I, I know people who have been handed record labels and moved here from Florida, moved here from Iowa, but it's not really a recipe for longevity, and in order to have longevity in the music industry, you have to like build upon every relationship that you meet when there is chemistry there and when it's someone that you genuinely connect with. Mm. So, yeah, I, I mean, if I had just said, oh, I don't know, I'm not gonna send him anything, who knows what would have happened, so. Yeah, absolutely, and so your first Grammy nomination? Yeah. Uh, and now you're executive producing several projects. Do you believe you need to be multifaceted in the music industry in your case? You're being a songwriter, executive producer, and a musician to ultimately be successful in today's music industry? Absolutely, especially if anyone has aspirations to go into the songwriting or producing side of things. Uh, when you're in the room with an artist, you're, you're never one thing. You're, you're writing with them, you're ideally contributing to the track, whether you're on the computer or not. Uh, you're a therapist as well. And I started as an artist and still have an artist project that I work on and knowing what it takes to be an artist is really important when you're in the room with them because you have respect for the amount of work that goes into everything that they're doing. Um, I know songwriters who haven't been artists who like are like, ah, artists are such babies. <laughs> they're, 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 they're tired, they're, they're upset because their label's not communicating, but it can be really difficult um, to be in that position. But yeah, as far as executive producing goes, it's been really rewarding to have control um, and creative input over an entire project. And additionally, like on the financial side, if you're planning on being a songwriter, uh, do not plan on just being a songwriter because unfortunately in this day and age, it's really difficult to make a living just doing that because you don't have master points, you don't get fees, you just collect your publishing from Spotify, which is not enough to buy you lunch or pay your rent. So yeah, it's important to expand your skills, especially while you're in school, like take advantage that you have a studio here, it's incredible, and uh, learn what you can about engineering and vocal producing and play, play as many instruments as you can and use all the resources. Fantastic, and speaking of difficulty, um, just show of hands, how many freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. What was the most difficult part of transitioning from school into your full-time role? Mm. <laughs> I almost, I think the answer might be the same for people in music and out of music, which is just having control of your own schedule and not having, you know, oh, I'm a, I'm a big academic person. I loved essays, I loved tests, I loved turning in assignments and getting a well done or a grade. Yeah. So kind of venturing into a field where everything is subjective and one person can hear a song and think it's the best thing they've ever heard and another person can hear the same song and not answer your email. Uh, learning how to <laughs> validate yourself is really important and I think it was a big lesson coming out of school and still learning the lesson because some songs that I have from three or four years ago, or even songs that I wrote while I was in college are getting cut now. And I'm like, oh, I thought that was a bad song because people ignored it mm. three years ago, but it, it really is less about the songs and more about um, you know, persistence. Absolutely. And what's the most fulfilling part of your job? I love making music. There is nothing better to me than at the end of the day, especially when we're talking about like pop songwriting and production, you know when it's right and finishing a day with a group of friends or even by myself and playing the song five times at the end of the day and being like, this is, I don't know what a hit is, but it feels like a hit and it feels great to me and I will listen to it in the car for the next two weeks. Um, that's the most fulfilling thing. And, and it's funny because like you'd think it would be a Grammy nomination, but uh, when you get one of those, you're like, now I need to figure out how to get the next one. So it's less <laughs> fulfilling than you think it is, but it is very exciting. And I'm really proud of uh, where I've come from, or where I started and where I am now in the past few years since I graduated. And Absolutely. Yeah. And we're proud of you. So thank everyone, you. Nicole Cohen, thank you so much. Uh, not off the hook yet. Another lightning round is among us, people. Uh, most memorable UCLA moment. Oh, God. Undie run, I guess. I don't know. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> do they still do that here? Uh, okay. Oh, uh, uh, inverted, jumping in the inverted fountain after a senior recital. Oh, very nice. <laughs> Everyone knows that's a tradition, right? You have to go in the inverted fountain when you graduate? Okay. Part cool. of the undie run, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I got to speak at my graduation, so that was really fun. Oh, very nice. <laughs> she did great. <laughs> uh, it would be spring sing. So I was in a group and we ended up winning spring sing. 
the year I was in it. Sweepstakes, so. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, but uh, a lot of great memories that I could think of. Um, probably meeting James Horner. He came and gave a master class, film composer, um, who's also a UCLA alum. Getting to meet him before he passed away, that was great. I'll always remember that. Beautiful. Very nice. Well, up next, we have Nicole Garcia. Uh, studio and concert musician, recent performances include the 2023 Grammys with Luke Combs. We have the Lady Gaga residency in Las Vegas with Billie Eilish, with Rihanna, and uh, also played with Burt Bacharach's last recorded release with Elvis Costello. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. A round of applause. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. So Nicole, especially being in the gigging world, what are some best practices that you use to foster a healthy network of contacts and colleagues to keep the gig work coming in? I think the best thing is to nurture those contacts you've made all along the way and making sure that you always nurture those ones because they always come back. And they're usually the ones that support you the most because they know where you came from and they know your bones, so they know how you grew and to see where you are. And that networking alone is like a spider web. You meet their friends and their friends are rad and they like you and it just keeps going. But I think a root of it, and that's something I learned at UCLA, is you keep your friends here. The, the ones that you meet here are the ones that are growing right alongside you and are reaching for that same sunshine. So that's the best way to keep that. Amazing. And networking, it's a reoccurring theme that everyone will hear throughout your time here at UCLA in general, and it's one of the most vital parts of the music industry. Um, can you tell us about a time where a connection led to an opportunity for work in your field? I, I think actually it was here at UCLA. We were doing a chorale concert. We were actually doing the UCLA chorale concert, and we were performing at the, I think, the Bel Air Presbyterian with uh, uh, Don Nguyen. And I just, we were doing something, I, and to, to this day I cannot remember which chorale piece it was, but it was so moving that I, it was like the first time I'd gotten like fully lost in something. And Don Nguyen said, oh my God, you, you, I love how you got lost there. I saw I just, the place, just everything about it just, just transported me. He introduced me to someone, hey, he needs a violinist and soon. Can you come in for him? And that led to that, led to that, led to that. So just those moments, especially like a concert, you have no idea how many people who support the arts come to UCLA concerts just to sit and chill. And then they want to give money to you. <laughs> and I'm saying that, and, and I'm saying that truly because they're because with those people are saying, "Hey, you're, you sound great. You you sound like you really love what you do. How can I help you get better? You you'll be surprised. You you would be walking down the hall when that kind of stuff happened, and I would be really shocked. I thought, no way that you were sitting there watching me. There's no way. But there are like. There are like music angels out there who want to see you succeed. So always treat every opportunity that you have as your moment to show everybody what you got, even if nobody's there. Yeah, yeah give yeah. them a round of applause for that, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if you could be a UCLA student again, what would you have done differently or taken advantage of knowing what you know now about the industry? Knowing what I know now, I think I would have been a little bit more brave and try other genres, mm -hmm. okay? Because it was here that I met Kenny Burrell in the jazz department. I was noodling around, and I didn't know what I was noodling about. And then he said, how can, can I help you show you what you're trying to learn? I was by myself. He was already probably on his way home, and he took that 10 minutes to show me, this is what you can do to expand your horizon. Now that, I should have taken a lot more serious and said, you know what? If there's jazz, there's gotta be other stuff. There's gotta be musical theater. There's gotta be something besides classical. There's gotta be fiddle playing. There's gotta be other things, other genres that you could try. Then, you know, when, you, when your time comes to do uh, anything like a, a soundtrack, you are ready. But I had to learn a lot of that stuff along the way. If I had just taken the time at UCLA and spent it kind of nagging my teachers, hey, give me 10 minutes, show me what you can show me so I can learn how to do that. Anything to transform your musical experience will help you tremendously. 
how many gigs a year would you say you do? And then can you tell us what your favorite gig ever was and why? Okay. Okay. So, so gigs come and they fluctuate. So as, as all musicians will know, we will, it's feast or famine. <laughs> it's the, the faucet turns on and the faucet turns off and then you just go, God, I hope I work next month. Please, God, let me work next month. My favorite ever gig, though, is um, we got to record a track for Will I Am at his studio. Now, I didn't know he had a studio in LA, and he has like this, this incredible, like, <laughs> he, his studio looks like a spaceship. It's just the, the most unbelievable thing in the middle of LA. And we were recording something for NASA. Now, I was like, what? It's just this NASA on the front. I thought it was NASA the rapper, so I got confused. <laughs> and then we recorded it, and then he says to me, you, we're sending this to NASA. I said, yeah, yeah, NASA, NASA. He goes, no, no, NASA, space NASA. I said, oh, why? <laughs> because it's, it's going to be on a rover that's going to be, it's going to play our track on the surface of Mars <laughs> to see if anybody will respond. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, you can imagine, I don't care even if we didn't make any contact with anybody in the face, the fact that my... Something I played on was being played on another planet. Yeah. <laughs> I think that is the best. Was the track ever. called Baby Shark? <laughs> <laughs> no? no. Oh, okay. Just what was the track? Was it's yeah. universal language? It, it really is. It was just like a. It was like a random pop song. It really. Wow. I can't even tell you what it was, but just the fact that we were. I mean, this little, this little ro this rover with like little tiny eyes was rolling around and playing this track like just to nothing. It was just really wow. surreal. What a cool opportunity. Yes. He performed it with the National Symphony Orchestra in DC and I was at that concert. Oh, oh that wow. must have been wow. absolutely Crazy. amazing. <laughs> oh, I wish. Yeah. Nicole Garcia, thank you so thank much. You so really much. Thank you so much. We have another lightning round, ladies and gentlemen. Here it is. Uh, if you could have lunch with one artist, who would it be and why? And I should clarify, living or no longer with us. Um, I, living or no longer with us would still be Carole King anyways. Mm -hmm. I just, I grew up on her music and would love to, she just seems lovely. Hopefully she is. Nobody tell me if she's not. But. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Israel Kamakamwiwi Ole, I would love to meet him and speak to him just because he dealt with uh, the ancient music from islands. So it would be really fascinating to hear what he thought about that. I'm going to go uh, Ella Fitzgerald just because mm. she is a legend. <laughs> Leonard Bernstein. Wow. Um, I just, the way that he would explain music yeah. to, you know, the common folk, I think is amazing. I would love to just sit and pick his brain. Can't wait to see that upcoming movie, by the way, as well. Yeah, it's good. You never know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Netflix movie? Or? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we'll admit like that. that answer, though. Uh, Mahler, I think. I love Mahler's music, and I just love to get to meet him. Amazing. Uh, up next, Satya Fuentes. Uh, Netflix creative music executive on the original series for the team of Bridgerton, Outer Banks, and Stranger Things. Satya previously worked for Black and White Music Supervision under Emmy-nominated music supervisor Jen Malone, having also ha held tenure in the film music department at Universal Pictures. Round of applause for Satya. Thank you. <laughs> so Satya, as a jazz es 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 no ethno musicology, it, it, it comes out eventually ethnomusicology major, what did you originally want to have as a career? You know, I think I wasn't sure. I, I went into the performance major full-heartedly. Um, I had done the jazz thing. I was a little burnt out on it. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go like the band kind of route, artist route. Um, but my dad was a filmmaker and I was kind of looking for something that bridged more of my interests. Um, and when I found out about music supervision, I was like, oh, this is really cool. This incorporates storytelling. This incorporates um, music as a narrative, um, and I think that's when I figured out, like, oh, this world of sync and music supervision um, exists, and I got really, really excited. Absolutely, and can you tell us what it was like, and this is for all the seniors and juniors especially, upon graduating from UCLA, how did you land your first full-time job? Uh, to be completely honest, it was abysmal for a few months. Um, it is so difficult <laughs> to get a job, not to scare people, but it can be so challenging to get a gig. Um, 
right after school. And I thought it was so sad. I did so many internships while I was at UCLA, and I thought this is going to be a breeze. Um, and I got nothing for like a few months, and I was terrified. And I was like, how could this happen to me? I thought I did everything right. I did everything by the books. Um, and it was so hard. Um, and like, frankly, my first job out of college wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. It was um, selling on the sync side, so like pitching music. Um, and from there, you know, I got each job. I did a lot of job hopping, um, but each job got me a little bit closer to what I wanted to do. So from like selling, then I went to a, a production music library company, and from there I was meeting music supervisors. From there I went to Universal Pictures, and uh, I wasn't on the creative side, which I really wanted to be, but I was in licensing, where I learned how to do um, clearance, which is so integral into music supervision. From there I got a job with Jen Malone, because she knew I knew how, uh, how to do clearance. So I think it's a lot of, it's, it's very rarely a, a straight path to exactly where you want to be. A lot of times it, it's making different steps, and, and like you said, meeting people along the way. Every little person that you meet, you don't know it's going to hand you your next gig. So it's, like you said, so important to be kind, so important to be open to different people. Yeah. That patience and persistence really paid off because eventually that opportunity did open up and you are able to get in there. Um, and you had the criteria, to, and you're in the right place at the right time as well. Um, what, what would you say is your, has been your hardest obstacle to overcome to get to the path that you're on today? Um, honestly, it's that. It's a lot of, you get a lot of no's and, uh, before you get a single yes. And, you know, you see people's where they are and you think, oh, they're so successful and it must have been so easy for them. And I had a million no's. I had a million heartbreaks. Um, and I had, took a lot of jobs that I wasn't excited about, I wasn't super proud of. Um, but each one, you learn a little bit more and you get a little closer. But I definitely had a lot of, like, things that I would, at the time, seem so dramatic and so devastating and, like, oh, I'm not, I'm not getting any closer to doing what I want to do, and you realize that every opportunity you learned something so important, whether it's clearance, whether it's making this connection with a music supervisor. Um, so I think there were a lot of obstacles to get where I am, but it's, um, I, I w would do it the same way all again, I think. I, you know, I, I meet some people who got their dream job right away, and um, I'm kind of happy with my path because I think uh, sometimes people like that, they only have a very limited bandwidth of their experience, and when you do have to kind of go all over and you can say, hey, I, I actually did a bunch of crappy piano gigs too in restaurants where no one was listening to me but you know you get <laughs> you get experience doing that too so um it's all it's all beneficial and uh what's been your favorite project at netflix so far and can you just talk a little bit about your involvement in the project and um just so everyone gets a sense of how long these projects last kind of like a yeah. timeline as well um probably my favorite one the one i'm most proud of i'm working on right now it's called the brother's son um it's an aapi project i'm filipino um, so it's very close, yes, very close <laughs> to my heart. Um, we have an entirely Asian music team from our composers, Nick Lee, who we were talking about, Nathan Matthew David, and Angela Sistio is our music supervisor. So I am just so proud that we were able to get an entirely um, Asian uh, group of folks for an Asian story because it is mm. so rare that that happens. Very frequently, you know, we we are you see these stories, and it's so cool that there's. Um, you know, diversity on the screen, but behind the screen, you know, it's not represented. So that's something I'm, I'm super passionate about. It comes out later this year. I'm super excited. And it has Michelle Yeoh, so that's oh, the coolest part. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Satya, thank for you. everything. And round of applause for Satya. All right. Lightning bolt. Here we go. <laughs> Lightning round. Uh, favorite place on UCLA campus? Music Cafe. Sati and I, oh. we graduated the same year and we spent so much time there. <laughs> North Campus, right near the art department, is one of my favorite places. Very nice. Uh, Powell or Music Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the steps of Powell looking at Royce Hall at night. Mm. Oh, and mine's Royce Hall. I love Royce Hall. It's so beautiful. Yeah. A lot of good memories. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> I like the sculpture garden. Yeah, yeah, classic. Um, Vince Villanueva, a manager of music clearance at Netflix and animation, unscripted and kids and family shows. Vince previously worked on the music team that revived American Idol on ABC and served as director of music clearance at DreamWorks Animation from 2015 to 2017. Round of applause for Vince, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. So Vince, when you were a student at UCLA, what were your original plans upon graduating, and uh, did they involve working at an entertainment company like Netflix? So I originally came to UCLA to be a composer, 
and I was going to be the next John Williams, like every other composer who comes to UCLA. <laughs> and then I started taking orchestration. I realized, not for me. So I ended up doing music education, and then actually had a job lined up in education at a junior high school um, when I graduated. But I also wanted to work in entertainment. And so I thought, if I'm going to do it, this would be the time to give it a try. So I decided to uh, pursue entertainment, try and get a job uh, in that field. I got one, and so I put the education and teaching on hold and said, I can always come back to that you know, if the, ed if the entertainment thing doesn't work out. 25 years later, here I am. <laughs> so it worked <laughs> out. So. Beautiful. And what are some of the skills you acquired at UCLA that directly applied to your work today? Ooh, um, I would say two. There's two things that come to mind. One is I was a director of an a cappella group, and to be able to direct your peers is very hard. It's very hard to do because you have to be the leader. Some are older than you, some are younger, but you have to make those decisions. So it's being, being able to make hard decisions and not, you know, as musicians, we tend to be a little more emotional than other people. So to not let the emotion take over, have it be more head than heart. So that was the first thing. The second thing would be, um, and all musicians do this or have to experience this, is learning how to pivot. So, you know, you're, you're playing outside and your music blows away, so you have to go by memory, or your amp blows, or your chord doesn't work, or whatever. You immediately have to switch and the show must go on, and you have to figure out how to get to the end. So taking that skill set and magnifying it in my current job and along the way, it was learning how to pivot when things get really hard or that when things seem like there's no way we can do this. How can we do this? Well, again, the show must go on. We have to get to the end somehow. So it was those two things, I think, learning here, started here, that really helped me in my career now. And how do, how do you go about mastering some of the critical parts of your current job that you didn't learn as a student? Um, were they on the fly, or were you trained? Does it come along with, with the position? Yeah, so I didn't know music clearance existed right. when I graduated from here. Because you know, at the time, you were either a composer, a performer, or an educator. And so getting out into the real world, I knew I wanted to work in music. So um, I had to first learn what other things there were. And so I learned about music clearance. And so taking that and figuring out how, how that works and what it is really um, kind of helped me figure out what my path would be going forward. Can you give a brief example of what music clearance is or a definition? Yeah, so music clearance is the legal side of music. So we work with the creative side and we make sure whatever creatively they want to put in their projects that we legally have the rights to use those songs. So that's one aspect, that's kind of the bigger aspect. The second is when you have an original song um, created, or a score, and you wanna make sure that the score doesn't sound like anything that's pre-existing, or an original song. Now, nobody knows every single song or score in existence, so it is kind of tough to do, but that's why you rely on so many people. So if we were to play an original song here, guaranteed, we'd be able to kind of source everybody and figure out, yeah, I think it's fine to move forward. Now, if it does sound like something that's pre-existing, then we have to rely on, like I rely on the training I got here at school in talking with songwriters or composers saying, hey, it's the same key. You know, that's the first giveaway. Um, the melodic rhythm is different or the chord progression or whatever it is. To be able to speak that musician language to other musicians gives an advantage. To, to be able to do um, that part of the job. Absolutely, and can you tell us about your craziest clearance moment and what it involved? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, uh, yeah. So the, <laughs> so if you're allowed to. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely, there's two. One is, um, so I worked at DreamWorks for a while and we did Shrek the Third and they insisted on having um, the Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin. And so in order to get this, they had to, um, well, we had to show Led Zeppelin how it was going to be used. The problem with animation is that it's normally in storyboards really early. So, and we didn't want to just send them a link 
this was, you know, 2007, so things weren't as advanced as they are now. So we had to actually um, put it onto tape, fly the tape out to the UK, show them individually what it was, and at the end of the day, in if you ever watched the movie, um, it's only 17 seconds <laughs> in the movie. So the issue that we had was that it's bookended by two songs. One's an original song, and one is Barracuda on the other side. So it's telling Led Zeppelin, we want to use your song. Um, it starts out with this little birdie song that's original. Your song, awesome. And then goes into Barracuda. So we good? You know, eventually, it was a lot of back and forth, um, but eventually they approved it, and you see it in the film. Wow. So, yeah. So, oh, how much? Yeah, and it was expensive. Six figures. Let's put it that way. So, yeah. So that was the first one. The second one, real quick, um, was on When They See Us, which is more recent. Um, I... So it's funny, I was actually on a panel with Ava DuVernay, and this was before Ava was the Ava that we all know, and told her what I did, and she's like, I'd love to talk to you. Um, I ended up working on her very first short, and it goes to what Nicole was saying, is that you never know what's gonna happen. Um, and so now, whenever she does projects, she, I work on her shows. So I worked on When They See Us, and we we're finishing the show, there's four episodes, and the last episode, she wanted to use um, a specific song, and it was a Nipsey Hussle song. Um, and he had just passed away two weeks prior. And she absolutely wanted to have this as a, a tribute to him. And she said, I want you to, to guide this through. And I'm like, I'll try. <laughs> but she knew the family. So she was able to give me access to his family. And so I was working directly with them. Um, and we're going, we're going, we're going. We had to get it done by a certain time. And then there was a, a pause because I had, the, the Netflix wanted me to keep following up. And I said, I can't tomorrow because it's the funeral. So, and I said, out of respect for him and everyone involved, um, I'm, I'm not gonna follow up. And Netflix was like, we totally understand. Because at the end of the day, at the end of that email on the other end is a human. And so I said, I will follow up on Friday. We got the song. They locked it Friday night in order to qualify for the Emmys, and it ended up doing really well. But we got the song. So. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And very tasteful of you as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's much appreciated. Everyone, Vince Villanueva, thank you so much. All right. Lightning round. Here we go. <laughs> Who is your favorite musical artist right now and why? Uh, right now, it's, there's an artist that I work with named Lindsay Lomas. She's on Warner, and I just executive produced her EP that's coming out in three days, so you should hey. go listen to it. And it's actually, I'm obsessed with her. Anyways. Wow. Yeah. Uh, my favorite is Lady Gaga right now, because I'm working for her. So. <laughs> see, <laughs> She's we my see favorite. a recurring theme here. Yeah. We, uh, <laughs> we like our employers. Yes. To continue our theme, I'm going to tell you a fun one. I'm going to say Cole. Oh. Listen to her on Spotify. She is incredible. Her songs are actually so, so good. Please listen. Oh, very nice. Uh, I listen to a lot of Ed Sheeran right now. So. I was listening to Bjork this morning and just yeah. really enjoyed it. So, she's so creative. I just love her, her ideas. Yeah. Beautiful. Jeff Kricka, uh, film composer and orchestrator with awards for Turner Classic Movies, ASCAP and the Henry Mancini Foundation, and works featured in the Batman, Thor, Love and Thunder, Glass Onion, Marvel's Spider-Man trilogy, the Imagineering story, uh, Jojo Rabbit, Incredibles 2, Coco, Rogue One, a Star Wars story, Doctor <laughs> Strange, Star Trek Beyond, and Inside Out. I, Woo! I don't believe it either. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, so composing is often a slow burn as a career. Um, when did you notice that your composition career really started to take off and gain traction? And how could you tell? And do you attribute that to anything in particular? Yeah, it's a, probably a recurring theme that you're noticing up here is that there's not usually just one you know, pivotal turning moment. It's a lot of little baby steps that you take in your career. Um, and that certainly was the case for me. 
Um, you know, it's, it's not as though, like, just because you're an amazing composer, somebody's going to give you the responsibility to score the next Spider-Man movie or something. Um, so for me, one of those pivotal moments was actually going to school here at UCLA. Um, because, uh, and this is also a recurring theme, a lot of the connections and the relationships that I formed with other students, um, other faculty members while I was a student here, are still uh, people that I, I have relationships with today and find work with today. This, this morning I was uh, just uh, in the early stages of starting to orchestrate um, the Captain Marvel, the Captain Marvel sequel movie, which is called The Marvels, um, which is being composed by Laura Cartman. I met Laura while I was a student here at UCLA. I took classes from her at the, uh, the film uh, department. So, and she's incredible. And, uh, you know, although our relationship over, you know, it's been 15 years since I was a student here has definitely changed. I, I did intern for her while I was a student. Um, but uh, it's just so great, you know, to sort of like look back on, on this history that I have with her and, and other people too that I had met while I was a student here at UCLA. It just, it really, it just keeps giving, you know, the, the relationships that you form, the networks that you form with people. And it's all little baby steps. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. And what's the hardest part about starting a new project and what's your favorite part? The hardest part is always beginning because you're, you're trying to, you know, establish a sound or a, you know, a style or something that's going to work for the identity and the storytelling of the movie that you're working on. So if I'm composing the movie, that's always like the hardest hurdle to get over, um, is, is getting the filmmakers on board with the ideas that I'm having, <clears throat> having for their movie or their, their series or whatever it is. Um, and if I'm orchestrating, uh, it's also, that's the hardest thing is, is just starting. It's just beginning and, and making sure that everything that I'm doing is, is vibing and jiving with, uh, with what the composer's done and making sure that I'm fulfilling you know, the promise of their music to deliver that to the, the scoring stage with the orchestra performing. So, yeah. And working with the director for the first time, how do you find out about their communication skills, how they operate, and how do you pull out the music from within what they are communicating. I've worked with some directors who are super centric about the music and very specific and will give you handwritten notes that are pages long, others that just say good or bad. <laughs> uh, so how, how do you manage that? You just have to be really good at communicating. I think the best thing for a composer to learn that I learned early on was just not talk about music with, with directors. Talk about story. You know, talk about what the, the storytelling ideas are in their movies. Because if you start talking about music, you're just going to go down a path that's... <laughs> you, you never know, like, where, where it'll lead. Um, probably nowhere good. Um, <laughs> uh, it's much better that, that I, I get on board with what their ideas are with the storytelling in the movie and what I'm feeling as, you know, somebody that's, you know, part of this, the, experiencing the, the story. Um, and reacting against it and how I would want to feel as, as an audience member. Um, so yeah, it's, that's, you know, that hurdle to get over early on, you know, making sure everybody's on board with, with what we're doing and that we're walking in lockstep because we don't want to ruin their movies. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about a time when you were composing for a project and encountered a difficult situation and how you ultimately resolved it? Uh, yeah, there's there's a few that I could think of. Definitely, <laughs> there's always something on on a project where you you have you have a difficult moment and you have to to solve it. Um, one of my earliest short films that I worked on while I was a student here at UCLA, um, I remember uh, the director. Every demo that I was writing, uh, the director just kept saying, "Oh, it needs to be darker. It needs to be darker." It was a Civil War movie. It was it was a very dark movie. Was, <laughs> a lot of people were dying. Um, and uh, it's just like, it needs to be darker. And so everything to me that, that meant, oh, I need to go more dissonant or more, you know, low instruments, you know, something that's very complex and psychological. And then finally I realized, oh, maybe what we should do, because nothing that I was doing was working, was uh, I said, okay, well, what for you would be dark? Um, what kind of music would be dark? And he said, well, we should listen to the temp music. Um, because for him, the, the, the darkness that he was sort of looking for that I wasn't giving was actually in the temp music. They had um, this, this minor kind of very simple 
kind of piano piece. And then uh, the dark moment that he was uh, going for was actually this moment where it, it went from like minor to major. And for me, it was like this very bright, like the, the clouds opening up. So we had these two very different conceptions of what dark meant. Um, so yeah, uh, once you realize that and you learn how to like really communicate with people, I think you, you avoid things like that. <laughs> Communication Learning is experience. Key. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Jeff Kricka, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, now, unfortunately, no more lightning rounds, but this is the time to open it up for a little <laughs> Q&A. So anyone who has a question, feel free to raise your hand and we'll get to you. Um, and if you want to address it to a certain panelist, feel free to just ask or a, a general and one of us could step in and help answer it. So feel free to raise your hand and we could start. Uh, uh, and uh, let's wait for the microphone yeah, okay. as well. We got, <laughs> we got, we're professionals. Hello, here. hi. <laughs> um, I had a question for everyone. So when you're getting that first job or that first internship, what is the thing that gets your foot in the door or what is the, like, the key to almost convincing them that you're the thing that they need? I'd love to start with that. I think that especially when we are aspiring for a role within the industry, it's, it's usually at the top, right? Like we want to run a company, we want to do amazing things, but for a lot of the lower entry level positions, it could be as easy as getting a Diet Coke with ice for a client. And do they want a lime or do they want a lemon wedge? Uh, do they want it room temperature? Um, how do they want to present it in a mug or in the can? <laughs> and I, you know, these are the little minute details that are often overlooked for the more grandiose goals that we try to achieve in, in these roles. So I think mastering first and foremost the duties at hand and that are in the job description, you know, whatever it might be, the phone etiquette, sending emails, making copies of scripts, whatever it might be, I think it's really important to show that you have competency in those very basic skills first and foremost before getting to the next level. Yeah, I can, I can speak to the creative side as far as getting into writing sessions. And uh, I would say being a kind person and being someone that people want to be around is extremely important because the basis of the creative industry is collaboration. So just be a good person as much as you can. <laughs> Uh, I think a real big part of it is being grateful, no matter what gig you got. Like, you could be at the worst gig, but you have to find something in it to be grateful for, because that shows more than anything. And it shows if you, if you look at every opportunity as an opportunity instead of an opportunity to impress someone and say, hey, you need me, They'll, they should be able to see it within you without you having to try. So it really should come from in here. Um, mine, I'd say, was two part. One is doing your homework and really doing a lot of deep research. I know I did a ton of cold emails to get different jobs, um, and the ones that I got responses back, I did like you know a paragraph really explaining that I understood who they are, I understood their work, and um, I think that goes a really long way. And when I get cold emails and I know that the person did a little bit of extra homework, those are the people that I really take time to connect with. Um, and number two, kind of like uh, what Ryan said about, you know, when you're getting into, you know, probably your first job will be more administrative is like, how do you make people's lives easier? Um, I think a lot of people go in like, how can I be the most creative person ever? And how can I exploit my, you know, my creativity and my musicality? Um, but a lot of times it's like, hey, I can make a really awesome spreadsheet that will make your life 70 times easier. And those are the people that people are excited by. It's not because you can make the coolest playlist in the world. A million people can. Um, so I think that goes a long way. Yeah, pretty much everything they said. The one thing I would add is um, passion, to have passion for what you want to do. I know when I've interviewed people, I say, why do you want to work in music? And everybody says the same thing. I love music, and I listen to all this kind of music. So I say, what else? Yeah. Well, you know, music makes me feel this. Great. Anything else? <laughs> what else? Because we feel a lot more. Like, we want those goosebumps moments, and I want to work in an industry where I can get that. Those are the things. Like, you have to really dig deep and let your inside part out, and that passion, I think, will help. Yeah, I would say, uh, second all of these, um, it's really what I've understood. It's about being a really good collaborator with the people you work with um, and forming really good relationships with, with everyone. So, yeah. Fantastic question. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's give a round of applause. Yeah. Don't be shy.
Oh wait, who? Sorry, I didn't see the hand. Any hands? Up. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Hi, this is for everyone. Also, um, how do you balance when you have a lot of a lot of different gigs all in the air at the same time and prioritize your time and at the same time be thinking, do I need to clear space in my schedule for the thing that hasn't come yet? And which one do I let go of and, you know, to create the space and know that some something you want more is going to come into that space because I find myself just so busy and I'm like, I don't think there's space for the new thing to come in yet. So how would you think about that? I'd be happy to start. Uh, so there was this fascinating post about a Google executive who wasn't getting promoted. And what they ended up doing was they focused 100% of their job only on the focused task to get them promoted in their job description. They didn't take on any external, any um, side gigs or, or you know, helping other people out. They only focused on their job. And they ended up getting promoted within the year. And that really changed their trajectory. And I guess what I'm getting at is you really have to analyze what is important to you, whether it's the income or the prestige or your relationships that you want to keep expanding on uh, and, and prioritize in that matter. Um, especially within organizations, it's really tough to do that. But I think since it's so project focused, uh, prioritizing what is coming up on a deadline or what is going to be the most profitable for the company's objectives uh, comes first and foremost above everything. And that, so that's how I usually prioritize my uh, schedule. Um, I don't know if this will relate directly to your job or situation, but on the creative side, I uh, find that saying no to uh, way more things than I used to say no to has helped a lot. And I see a way bigger return when I'm working on things that I'm very passionate about and projects that I really believe in with artists that I really believe in. When I started, I was doing seven days a week, two, de two sessions a day, and saying yes to every possible thing I could. And as I've uh, gotten a little bit closer to where I want to be in my career, it's, it's great to hold off and say, all right, I can dedicate three weeks to this artist, and then I can take a week off, and I can work on my own stuff. And yeah, I, I do find that when you're truly passionate about something, you, you end up seeing a greater return on it in the long run. Um, I, think it's, I think that's one thing that we don't really talk about is making space, because that creates space for mental and, and emotional health, too. And as much as we want to get all those amazing gigs, the one mantra I always had is, there are always going to be gigs. So regardless of the best gig that you see now or on the horizon, it'll come if you just stay focused. One of the things is to really understand you as a, as a being, because you at the end of the day, is, you're not a machine, you're a human. So you really gotta take care of yourself mentally and emotionally first so then you can attack all the other things that you want to go for. But yeah, take care of you first. Uh, this is such a good question, something I think we think about at Netflix a lot about prioritization. Um, but for me, I think it's a lot of compartmentalizing different parts. So you know, it's like in part of my day, there's some things I absolutely need to get done by the end of the day. There's some things I need to get done by the end of the month, or it's a project that's a six month project. And then also making time, I think, for your, you know, what is your mission? What is your driving thing outside of your corporate life? What is your artistic mission? And how can I contribute a little bit to that every day? Um, and you know, the larger goals, because I think it's really easy, especially in a corporate job, to just kind of go day to day and you lose kind of the, the zoom out and the, the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say similar to Nicole, it's, it's honing your instinct and really trusting that instinct because that's what's going to get you, you know, to the next thing. So. Yeah. I think it's totally okay to say no to things yeah. at a certain yes. point. You did, when, especially when you're younger, you're just told say yes all the time right. so that you take every opportunity and while that's true, yeah, you, you, at, at a certain point, there's only so much we as humans can do. <laughs> so and you really have to try to, at a certain point, find a way to carve out time in your day so that you're not, you know, 24-7 always working and that you have a life and <laughs> time to rest and, you know, walk the dog or whatever. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I really try to seek out projects as much as I can with, with people that I, I really work well with and en enjoy working with. So that's the thing that I'll usually look for on a project is if, if it's somebody that I have a good relationship with, I know I'm gonna have an okay time working on it as opposed to maybe somebody I've never worked with before. 
you know, I, th I think that's really important because at the end of the day, you want to go home happy. So, <laughs> yeah. Fantastic question. Thank you so much for asking. Really appreciate it. Yeah. We've got time for about two more questions. Yes. Hi. Um, I think my question, I think, is mostly for, like, the gigging side, but a conversation that I have a difficult time with or that I find a lot of people don't give a lot of information on, I think, is, pay like, payment and rate. And I'm finding myself kind of, like, how do I go into this conversation knowing that, like, I'm getting paid what I should be and I'm not getting ripped off, especially because I have no, like, prior knowledge. So how, how do I kind of enter that conversation and kind of establish a rate? That's fair. Yeah, knowing market rate or your rate or what your worth is is one of the the most important journeys of life, right? And all of facets and uh, knowing whether to pass up, as we were saying, if no, if it's not meeting that criteria or outweighing the opportunity for this, uh, you know, opportunity. Um, it's it's really really tough thing to do, but I think I'd first and foremost ask peers around you what the go ahead market rate is. Set a, a rate for you on the absolute lowest that you would go, and know that if they offer it to you, that the negotiation you shouldn't be offended by the first offer because at least it's the intro to it and see if you have any wiggle room and it's all part of the the fun thing of of negotiation. But um, you know, once once you have an offer. Uh, I would say shoot for the stars because they're they're not going to withdraw the offer from you after your first uh, counter, unless it's egregious and it's like six thousand million figures high. You know, <laughs> so as long as you're within the ballpark range, you just got to feel it out. And I'd say have fun with the process as well because it means that you're you're getting offered jobs. Yeah, I would just add to that and say um, not to be afraid to lose the job because. Yeah. Uh, when you're starting, it's, it feels very terrifying to have an opportunity in front of you, and you feel like, how could I give this up? But I've certainly, I've lost out on song deals or production deals because the artist was trying to take publishing on a song that they didn't write, or they were not willing to pay, I'm a producer as well, and they weren't paying, willing to pay a production fee, but they're with a label, and, and all, all sorts of weird situations come up. Also, artist managers, they just want to save their artist money. They don't really care about you all that much, <laughs> um, generally speaking. So whether or not they're telling you the truth about what they can really afford, that's up to your instinct. And you just have to walk in being willing to leave most of the time, especially as a woman. Like, you just have to be like, this is what I'm asking for. And if you can't do it, find somebody else. And they will find someone else. But um, you can't sell yourself short because it'll set a standard for you going forward. And they'll hear, oh, I, we got her for this. Like, yeah. So you don't want to do that too much. But it's hard. It's really difficult. But ask, ask, ask around. I think that's the biggest piece of advice for sure. Um, I totally agree with Nicole and Ryan. But I also want to throw in what Vince said. A lot of that, too, is instinct. You have to kind of feel out the project. Because sometimes you can get, like, they can give you, I'm going to give you a million dollars, and halfway through, you only got five. That, that, and you should be able to go, OK, I got to leave. This is not for me. But sometimes a lot of it comes with just the first conversation with that person. So use that. Um, I'm not sure if you're doing it in a corporate sense or a more gigging kind of thing. I will say California law now requires them to post a range of salaries. That's like a new thing. Um, so that's really beneficial. That hasn't been around before. And you can get a good kind of estimate of where you are. And I think using ranges is really valuable from those initial conversations, if it's with HR or an employer, to really kind of understand where you are. In my initial conversations, I'm always really vague. And I give like a big range. And I say, are we in the ballpark? Because um, if we're not in the ballpark, then maybe it's not an opportunity. But I will also say another thing is I've taken a few jobs that I've taken a pay cut, but it's ultimately got me way more money later because of that opportunity was worth more than yeah. a job that was paying more. So it's, it's not always a straightforward line as far as your income going like this. A lot of times, like, my income's yeah. definitely been like this. Um, so, yeah. Well, for keeping it real, when I went from DreamWorks to then go work on American Idol, I took a 33% pay cut in my salary. But at the time, American Idol was the big hit show. So there are trade-offs that sometimes happen. The other thing, too, is whatever they offer, whether you're a songwriter, a composer, whatever that number is, it's always good to get clarification as to what it entails. So yeah. this means um, you know, I pay production costs, I pay musicians, I pay everything out of this, because this range is what I can do. 
So what that does is it helps set not set a precedence because if I just gave you one number and that's what you go at, I know the next time, well, they did it for this much then. But if you split it up and really clarify as to why you're getting that, when it comes to the next negotiation, you could say, yeah, we did it there, but production costs actually were twice as much here. Mm -hmm. Musicians were twice as much here. This is what I'm looking for. So yeah. a little insider info. Definitely <laughs> communicate as much as you can with, with not just the people that you're hoping to work with, but also your peers and, and see what they yeah. Yeah, are getting paid um, for similar you know, projects. Um, and other types of things too that can compensate, whether it's the opportunity um, or any kind of back-end payments, royalties, uh, those sorts of things that, yeah. that can change the calculus definitely, but only you yourself know how much you're worth. Yeah. So um, you just have to obviously take that into account, yeah. yeah. Wonderful question, we got time yeah. for uh, not, one Not more. talked about enough. Yeah, oh, great question. Having worked with a lot of conductors being a cellist, I've had a lot of, let's say, interesting uh, times that I've had to go through. How would you deal with a problematic person in your field? Just out of curiosity. Thank you. I love to kill them with kindness. <laughs> they can't break me down, so they'll come at me with some heat, and I'll just go back with a smile and a solution which is ultimately what I, I hope they're looking for, unless they're just trying to be problematic, in which case I could be problematic back. You know, we could, uh, make a, that's what they're looking for. But um, you, know, you, you can't really take anything personally in this industry because there are so many creatives, there's so many people who are trying to get to the finish line and some tempers might come out. So I just try to stay as cool-headed as possible and, and do it all with a smile. Um, yeah, I, part of why I love being a songwriter and a producer is that I never have to see them again because I make my schedule. Uh, the other thing is I, I did find that like most of the charlatans, like the sketchy people, are when you start. Uh, as you kind of move through the ranks, the, the nice people tend to rise to the top and the honest people tend to rise. Uh, and you'll find one or two you know, blemishes every once in a while. But uh, yeah, in the early days, just got to cut them out. <laughs> it's not worth it. It's never worth it. I just double what they say. It's exactly how you should handle it. Same thing, kill them with kindness. Um, and also, I don't know if, in my specific world, a lot of times if there's a disagreement creatively, it's giving like a menu of options because um, there's so many different ways to do it. And I think if you give people options of different ways to approach it, you can usually mediate a solution. I would say, yeah, definitely kill them with kindness, but also just to listen and say, let me just clarify what is the issue. Just I want to make sure I hear you correctly and have them re-explain what, what the issue is and then how would you want to help, how can we help you resolve this? And to do that, it really kind of takes the temperature and brings it way down. And then from there, any, utilize any one of these situations and you'll be able to solve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, because usually we're in very high pressure situations, you know, time is money and you're <laughs> trying to get through so much music so quickly. Really, the, the best way is just to stay positive no matter what you can do. And that's the best environment to be creative in then under those circumstances. So, and just try to avoid people like that in, in the long run if you can. And, and you're right. I, I don't think many horrible people tend to rise very far. They, they tend to fall away because of the personality. Yeah. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for coming to the first Insider Access at the UCLA Herb Roberts yeah, School of Music. You. Really appreciate it. There's a uh, couple people that I just wanted to thank real quickly. Dean Strempel, Liz Volwinkel, yeah. Brandon Faber, Cameron Roberts, Sean Allen, and to all of our amazing panelists, Nicole Cohen, Nicole Garcia, Satya Fuentes, Vince Villanueva, and Jeff Kricka. Thank you Thank so you. much.